Hello everyone, here we'll be discussing 3.8, which is a topic on exponential growth and decay. And the first thing I want to talk about is population growth, essentially. And here we're kind of making this supposition, this assumption, I guess you can say, that the population grows at a rate proportional to its size. So if that assumption is met, then the following is true. And of course, this is just by the wording. So if the population grows relative, not relative, but proportional to its size, then that means that it's rate is a multiple, constant multiple of the size at a given time. So namely dpdt, its rate is equal to a number k times its population size p, where p is equal to p of t, so just in function notation, and that's the population size at time t, and k is just some constant. And essentially we'll be solving for k um, given this assumption is met. And believe it or not, this assumption is actually a natural phenomenon that occurs pretty frequently in nature especially with population growth. So this is something that, believe it or not, is, uh, again, something that actually does happen. So it's realistic to assume this, basically. And uh, here's a fact that we, uh, I mean, I can't really prove it to you right now because we don't have methods or techniques of solving differential equations yet. That More of that in calculus, too. Uh, but I can show you, indeed, why, why this is kind of the case. I just can't uh, build it up and prove it to you just from the ground up. But we can kind of check it kind of. So here it says the only solution to the differential equation dp to t equals kp is p of t equals p naught e to the kt, where p naught is p of zero, namely the population size at time zero. And the way I'm going to check this is notice p is equal to this. It's p of t. p is p of t. So dp dp dt is just its derivative. And derivative of a constant times e to the kt, just to show you, if p is equal to something times e to the kt, then notice its derivative p prime, or dp dt, let me write it like that, dp dt I think sounds better, is equal to what? It's just the constant multiplied by the derivative of e to the kt is k e to the kt by chain rule. And if you rearrange this so that k is in front of a, like this, notice here this is just equal to p, what the original function was. And to actually, um, to actually sh uh, show ourselves that a is equal to p at p of 0, all we really need to do is plug in t equals 0. And here this will give us p at time 0, because remember p is the function of t. So technically this is p of t, I'm just writing p for shorthand. And here if you plug in t equals 0, k times 0 in the x1 here is 0, e to the 0 is 1, so we just get a is equal to p of 0. So this kind of assures ourselves that this is indeed the solu a solution to this differential equation. And um, I mentioned this before in class, I hope that differential equation just means it is an equation involving derivatives of a function, and the solution to a differential equation is the function that satisfies that equation with those derivatives. Okay. And the last thing I want to talk about is relative growth. And I don't really have too much space here, but let me just write it over here. Let me write it in red, I guess. The relative growth really is just the, uh, the rate divided by the size. So relative growth, in this particular instance, is just dp dt, like this, divided by p. So and again, it's just literally the rate divided by the size. And that's all I'm going to say as far as that goes. Now we'll move into this example here. And here in this example, <clears throat> it says if the world population was um, basically uh, 2 million, 560 uh, million, 2 billion, 560 million in 1950 and 30, 40 million in 1960, then find the relative growth rate. So this idea in red I just gave us. And use a model to estimate population size in 1933, 1993 and predict population size in 2020. And at the time the book was written, because this problem is directly from the book, 1993 had already passed, but 2020 had, hadn't yet. And um, well, as of the time of this video is recorded, it is 2020. So if you want to check to see that what we get is actually accurate with the population size of this year, you can do so. Of course, when do you check? Because <laughs> That's another thing. It's like th these population sizes, is it at the end of the year or in the middle of the year? It's hard to tell. Or um, maybe it's the average. Who knows? So anyways, I'm going to erase this top part. I'm going to leave this question down here because it's a lot to write. And then we're going to continue the problem above.
Right, so I've erased it for space for the work of this problem. Now, there are a few things I haven't mentioned yet for this problem. And the, the one thing I should say that, again, kind of the assumption in this section is that the population grows proportionally to the size of the population. In other words, it satisfies that um, the differential equation we saw, meaning that it actually satisfies this model. So when I refer to the model in the problem, the model I'm referring to is that P of t is equal to P naught times e to the kt. Okay. Uh, great. Now what? Well, something I also didn't mention is remember the relative growth. So relative growth said what? It said that it's really just the rate at which the population grows divided by its size. And notice since we're assuming that um, these two things are proportional to each other, namely that the, the proportion that the, um, the growth rate is proportional to the size, that means that this relative growth rate is just the constant k as it turns out. Which should make a lot of sense because notice if you just multiply both sides by p, you get kind of our assumption here, dp dt is equal to kp. Which I know sounds kind of weird, but really the relative growth is just the uh, multiplier to t in the exponent of e in our model. So if we're assuming this model, we're given a few things here. Now, we can actually uh, change things quite a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to change the sizes to only be the number without the million. So that's a, namely a 2560 uh, 25, and a 3040. So those are going to be my population sizes in million. And I'm going to let this be t equal zero just because it's going to be easier to, to kind of uh, run numbers. This will then be t equals 10 because it's 10 years after. This will then be, well, t equals 43, I guess, because it's 43 years after time zero. And this will be, I guess, uh, I guess 70 years, yeah, after time zero. Wow. All right, so, um, right. So with that being said, we have a few things to get started with. The first two things tell us that p of zero is equal to 2560. And P of 10 is equal to 3040. And again, just to remind us what's going on, after zero years, our initial size is 2560. And after 10 years, our population size is 3040. And these numbers are in a million. Okay. And if we're assuming this is true, we can actually solve for a few things. Notice that this is literally just P naught. So really all we need to do is find K. And really, if we kind of plug things in, we have p of t is equal to 2560, 2560, there we go, e to the kt, and again, we want to find k, but look, if we let, k, if we let t equal 10, we get p of 10 is equal to 2560, e to the 10 times k, so we can solve for k in this, because we know p of 10 is just 34. So to solve for k, we're going to divide both sides by 2560. And then finally take ln of both sides to get um, e by itself. Well, maybe not finally, but that's like one of the steps. So we got 10k is equal to this number, which we can cancel the zeros right away just to simplify things as you go along. You can actually simplify a little more, I guess, by dividing by, by maybe 4, but I'm not going to do that yet. And then again, if you take ln of both sides, let me just kind of show how this looks. Taking ln of the left cancels e, so you just get 10k, and taking ln of the right leaves you with ln of that number. Okay, so we get 10k is equal to ln of that fraction, 304 over 256, and then that means k is equal to 1 over 10 times ln of 304 over 256, and now I'm going to use my calculator here to figure out what k is. All right, so using my calculator, I got k to be about 0 0.017185, around to six decimal places. And as a percent, this really tells us that this is 1.7% for our relative population growth. And um, actually, this completes the model because now we know what k is. So in fact, if we plug this in, we end up getting that p of t is 2560 times e to the... 0.017185 times t. Now we're kind of approximating here, obviously, for k. 
So you want to approximate to kind of a pretty decent accuracy level, and I think this is okay. So this is our model. We've answered the first part of the question with relative growth rate, and that's just about 1.7%. Now we need to use this model to predict the, these sizes in these years. So we're going to plug in 43, and then we're going to plug in 70. So I'm going to raise a few things to write that, and then uh, we'll move on to the next example from there. All right, so from a previous example here, I have this model we just got, and we uh, want to evaluate P of T. That T equals 43 years and 70 years after the initial time, which represents the estimate for 1993 and the, um, I guess, prediction of the population size at 2000, yeah, year 2020. And plugging it in and approximating with a calculator, we get this, uh, 5360 million and 8524 million for uh, those years, respectively. Now, something I want to talk about just a little bit is there's actually a way to, um, to write this model a little more precisely because notice we approximated this value k here and I still feel kind of weird about that, but that's just me because I like being precise. So remember that that was our k and k was 1 10th ln of that fraction, 304 over 256. And I said I wouldn't actually reduce that then, but I'll reduce it now. Um, if you half the top, you get 152. If you half the bottom, you get 128. If you half again, well, you get, let's see, 76 over 64. Half again, the bottom will be 32. Half of 76 is, let's see, 38. We can have once more, finally, you get 19 over 16. So the fraction actually reduces to 19 over 16, which is pretty nice and kind of surprising that it reduces that much. And the reason why I want to kind of explore this more is because notice this is our power, and our power involves an ln, but our base is e. So there is some simplification that can be done, actually. So I'm going to write this as at least the e part, e to the k, in fact, e to the kt, really, is e to the k to the t. And since k is 1 10th ln of 19 over 16, and then that's the t, notice you can actually uh, consider this power here multiplication to be a power of another power, kind of like we do with k times t. So this 1 10th that's multiplied can be brought out to multiplication on the outside power. And then you can see that these cancel. So really this model is exactly 2560 times the base 19 over 16 to the power t over 10. And this will give us a more precise answer but I notice here we're kind of estimating and predicting anyways, so there's a lot of rounding regardless. In fact, the notice here for 70, I actually rounded down, whereas for the, uh, for the estimation, not the prediction, for 43, I actually rounded up. So, yeah. It is still a little wonky, but yeah. To be more precise, we would get this. And in fact, we'll kind of see that come uh, back to us, this idea kind of come back to us, even though it goes a little bit away of um, the the idea behind the model, because the model's nice because we have E. Normally, in the context of 3.8, we approximate K anyways, but I wanted to show you that some simplification can actually be done. And I've done that, so good. So now for this example, we're given the half-life of a chemical element radium uh, 226. I guess it's a, what's called an isotope, I believe. I don't know too much about chemistry, but I just know from, uh, from application problems I've solved, of course. So the half-life is given to be 1590 years, meaning after this many years, the amount will half. So however much you have of this, um, of this particular item or chemical, whatever you want to call it, after that amount of time, the amount will be reduced to half. It just decomposes like that. So that's what half-life means. So we want, to find a, um, we want to find a model for a given sample with a given mass of 100 milligrams. There's a little bit of math to do here, though. Uh, something that I kind of want to say is that notice after 1590 years, we'll have half of our original amount. And that's, uh, that's kind of telling when it comes to the problem, because really what we're going to be using is the exponential model that we had. So let me kind of write this in a different color, just so I don't get in the way of too much. So it's going to be P is equal to, and then remember that's P of T, so I'll just write P of T, I guess, is equal to P naught E to the KT, Okay. And whatever the initial amount is, that's just P0. But what we know is that the half-life is, um, is 
is uh, given to be this number here. So after 1590 years, if you plug that in for t, you're going to get exactly half of what you started with. So this will be one half of p naught. And you can actually use this to find k, because notice really this is, if you plug it in, p naught e to the 50, uh, 1590 times k. And actually, look, if you divide through by p naught, then you get that e to the 1590k in this case is equal to 1 half. And you can solve for k. And what you end up getting is, well, let's see, if you take ln of both sides, so ln of this cancels the e, and ln of that is just ln of 1 half, and then divide by that number. So really this is just k is equal to 1 over 1590 times ln of 1 half, which, by the way, is a negative number, and it's not very difficult to see that because of the natural log property, or log property, of powers. Notice ln of 1 over 2, 1 over 2 is 2 to the negative 1, so the power negative 1 can come out, so it's a negative ln of 2. ln of 2 is 0.69, so it's positive, so it's going to be negative that. So, in fact, this will be a negative quantity. So basically with decay problems opposed to growth problems, the relative growth uh, constant k is negative opposed to positive, like we saw in the previous example. So now I'm going to approximate this k value here and then write our model out. And yikes, k ended up being a really, really, really small number, but it was negative indeed, like I predicted. So it's negative 4.359416 times 10 to the negative 4, meaning there's actually three zeros before... Uh, we hit a significant, before we hit a, a non-zero number, I should say, after the decimal. So instead of writing this monstrosity of a number, or I guess um, small, small number, but still it's gross to look at, I'm going to call our model P of T equals P naught, which we know is 100, times E to the KT, where K is given to be this guy here. And we're just going to use this in calculation. In fact, uh, and going to part B, so you could write it out if you want, but I'm just going to leave it like this for simplicity. So I'm going to part B, we want to find P of 100. So this is going to be, of course, 100 times E to the K, which is that guy, which I guess I'll write, negative 4.359416 times 10 to the negative 4 times 100. And now we'll use our calculator to see what we get. All right, so as it turns out, the answer for 100 years after would be about uh, 95 milligrams, actually. But instead of doing 100, because it's not really as significant, also the problem I'm taking this from really said 1,000, so I kind of uh, mis miswrote it here. For 1,000, you actually get about 65 milligrams, more or less. Uh, that's rounding up quite a bit, but still, that's fine. Now, here we want to find when will the mass be reduced to uh, 30 milligrams. So how are we going to solve this? Well, here's the opposite kind of case where we actually need to solve for t. So here we have the model um, p of t equals p naught, which is 100, e to the kt, where k is that weird number here. And we want to find t such that p of t is equal to 30. So we're going to solve this equation. And in fact, this is not super difficult to do. Basically, we'll just divide by 100, then take ln of both sides and then divide by k. And in fact, maybe we can just do that here. So notice if you divide by 100 to both sides, 30 over 100 reduces to 3 over 10. We get e to the kt. Taking ln of both sides gives us kt is equal to ln of 3 over 10, which again is going to be negative basically because 3 over 10 is a number that's less than 1. Okay, And then k is a known number. It's this constant. So divide by k to get t by itself. So we get that t is equal to 1 over k times ln of 3 over 10. So now we'll just plug this in with k being this guy, and then we'll see what we get for t. All right, so I've cleaned everything up here, as you can tell. And this was part c from the previous example. And if you plug in uh, this to the calculator, 1 over k times ln of 3 over 10. I mentioned that ln of 3 over 10 is negative, but remember k was negative, so it actually gives you a positive number for time, which is good. And it's this. After 2,762 years, which should actually make you feel pretty happy because remember that the half life was 1590, right? So if we start with 100, after 1590 years, it'll reduce to, to 50. And after another 1590 years, which is about 
what, uh, 3180 years, so like 3,180 years or whatever. Uh, that would be half of 50, which would be 25. 30 is a little more than 25. So this would be, a, it would take a little less than, um, than 3,000 years. And that, this sounds about right then, if that's the case. Now again, just like I did with the previous problem, I gave an actual more accurate model instead of uh, approximating K. And I want to show that here just a little bit. And it's kind of nice because we'll kind of see really how half-life actually plays into the model in a different way of developing the model. So I think it's kind of nice to see that. So remember, K is this, and our model was given by P of T being equal to 100, because that was our initial amount, basically, E to the KT. So we can write it as this, 1590 ln of 1 half times T. But remember, we want the ln and the E to be next to each other to cancel out. So I'm actually going to rearrange this, if you don't mind, as e to the ln of 1 half, and then write that all to the t over, or I guess, yeah, t over 1590, because it was 1 over 1590 times t, which is t over 1590. And notice these cancel out, so we indeed get 100 times 1 half to this power, t to the 1590 which is actually pretty cool looking, and I think it's kind of easier to see this than to see that model we saw earlier, but they're kind of the same is what we're discovering. And the reason why I think this is better, to, in some sense, is because it really tells you it's half-life. Because what did I say? I said that after 1590 years pass, you would have half of your original amount. So notice, when t is 1590, and the exponent, you just get one, and that's just 10 times, well, 10 times uh, 1 half, which would be 50. Similarly, after another 1590 years, so 2 times 1590, which would be 3180, 3180 divided by 1590, of course, is 2. 1 half to the 2 is 1 fourth, and 1 fourth of 100 is 25, which is just half of half of 100. So this idea actually makes a lot of sense when it comes to what half-life means. But anyways, this is beyond what the question is asking and a little beyond what we're trying to do in 3.8. There's like too much soul searching, so to speak. But anyways, I'm going to erase this and then we're going to move on to a few more examples. We're actually going to move on to a different topic involving what is called Newton's Law of Cooling. So let's take a look at that right now. All right, so as previously mentioned, this is what is known as Newton's Law of Cooling, which basically says that the rate of change of temperature of an object is proportional to the difference between that object and the surrounding temperature of that object. So very often you'll see examples where you have an object and you place it in an environment that's either cooler or hotter than the object itself, and we want to monitor the rate at which that object changes so that it becomes the temperature of the uh, surrounding room, basically. So imagine placing a turkey in an oven, or in this case, a can of Coke in a refrigerator, something like that. Um, right, so this is what that says. So again, just to kind of keep us, under, um, keep us in check with the terminology here, T is a temperature, and it's dependent of, um, of time. So you can write this as a temperature as a function of time, where T is time. Either in hours or minutes, just kind of depends what we're using. In this problem, we're actually going to use hours, even though minutes are given, but more on that in a second. And TS is the surrounding temperature. And by the way, notice that if an object is placed in a room or in a particular location, of a surrounding temperature, after a certain amount of time, it'll approach that surrounding temperature. So if you put, um, for example, turkey in an oven, obviously when you place a turkey in, it's gonna be cooler than the oven. After a certain amount of time, the turkey will eventually reach the temperature of the oven. It can't get hotter. Similarly, if you place a can of Coke in a refrigerator, it can't get cooler than the temperature of the refrigerator, for instance. So now, notice this is not exactly the situation we want in order to apply our model. It's close though, it's really close. In fact, it's so close that we can make a quick substitution here. If we replace Y with T minus TS, notice TS is constant in this case, unless you um, increase the temperature in the oven or decrease the temperature in the refrigerator or something like that. Um, besides any changing of temperature of the room, we're assuming TS is a constant, but the temperature changes and approaches TS as T goes to infinity, lowercase t goes to infinity, essentially. 
Um, now, uh, if we replace y with t minus ts, notice y is a function of t because t is a function of t, but t sub s is a constant. And if you take dy dt, that's the derivative of this, which is t, well, dt dt, minus zero because that's a constant. So the, the derivative of the left side is just equal to dt dt here. So we can replace in the substitution dy dt with dt dt and t minus ts with just y. So in fact, we're turning this weird looking expression, which almost looks like the exponential model we wanted, but not quite, into the exponential model differential equation we like. Now we can say that this, uh, this finally allows us to use the exponential model we saw, which remember is uh, p equals p naught e to the kt, only I guess it'd be uh, y equals y naught e to the kt. Anyways, we're gonna use that to solve this problem here. So it says a can of Coke at room temperature, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, is placed in a 44 degree refrigerator, and again, that's 44 degrees Fahrenheit. And then after 30 minutes, the can is cooled to 61 degrees Fahrenheit, so it cools down naturally. And we're asked to find these two things. What, te what temperature will we have um, the can of Coke be after 30 more minutes, and how long will it take to cool the can to 50 degrees Fahrenheit? So believe it or not, these are actually kind of the same questions we just saw in the previous example, only in the context of uh, temperature, not population or, um, or decaying of a chemical. So that's kind of interesting. So I'm gonna erase this, a lot of this, and we're gonna proceed with this example, and you'll see that the methods I used to solve is essentially the same as the previous example. So let's take a look at that right now. All right, so I've erased a few things here, and basically I've given us a summary of what the question says. We're given the t of 0 is 72, t of 1 half, half hour, is 61, ts is 44, that's the temperature of the refrigerator, and this is the model we were given from Newton's law of cooling. A is asking us for a t of 1, so after 60 minutes, because it's after 30 more minutes, so it's uh, 30 plus 30 is uh, 60. And uh, B is find the temperature, um, well, find the time when the temperature is 50. So solve t of t equals 50. So now, remember that we're letting t, y of t be t of t um, minus ts. So since uh, ts is 44, let me just replace this right away. And now we're going to plug in these values to figure out the model accordingly. So in fact, we want to find y of these values. So notice that y of 0 is t of 0 minus 44. Since t of 0 is 72, well, let's see, what's 72 minus 44? Um, looks like it's going to be 28, I think. Yeah, sounds right. Okay, and now uh, what is y of 1 half? Well, y of 1 half is t of 1 half minus 44. t of 1 half is 61. 61 minus 44 appears to be 17. So that's good. So now we have these two different y values and we can use this to solve for k in the exponential model. So recall that the exponential model is, in this case, y of t equals y naught e to the kt, or y naught y of 0, which we just found out is 28. So we can do that. And if we let um, t equal 1 half, then we have the y of 1 half is actually equal to 28 e to the k times 17, or 17k. Well, we've seen how to solve this before. Notice y of 1 half is just, um, I'm sorry, did this backwards. There we go. So y of 1 half is 17, but t is 1 half. So this is not uh, k times 17. This is k times 1 half, because t is 1 half. So let me just write this as k over 2. Sorry about that. So there we go. So now y of 1 half is 17. So we can replace y of 1 half of 17, and then divide by 28, then uh, take the element of both sides. So dividing by 28 gives us that e to the k over 2 is equal to 17 over 28. Now finally taking ln of both sides, which I'll show in red here. ln of this equals ln of that. Here they cancel out. We'll just get k over 2 equals ln of a number less than 1, remember, is negative which makes sense because the temperature is decreasing. So we'll have a relative growth rate that's negative. So we'll have the k over two is equal to ln of 17 over 28, which by the way, doesn't reduce. 
and that means multiplying both sides by 2, k is 2 ln of 17 over 28. And I'm going to approximate this in the calculator, write it up here. So we'll get k is approximately something, and then we'll complete the model for y, and then try to back substitute into finding the model for t finally. All right, so this is kind of crazy. My calculator actually gave me about negative one. It's negative 0.99798, super close to negative one. So I'll just round it as so. And again, uh, like I showed you previously, uh, twice already, there is a way to write the model more precisely, but rounding uh, k honestly is acceptable. So with that being said, uh, our model for y, so y of t, is equal to the initial um, y value, which was, uh, let's see, it was 72 minus 44, so that was 28, e to the kt, so that's negative 1 times t, so that's just negative t, actually. Which is actually really nice, it's a really nice looking model, actually. And uh, what's y of t? Remember, y of t is actually t of t, like this, minus 44. And we can solve for t of t by adding 44 to the other side. So the t of t, the temperature with respect to time, or in terms of time, is 44 plus 28e to the negative t. Which is a nice model because, well, the numbers are nice. <laughs> but it tells us that really that after time t, it's going to be 44 plus something. Now when t is 0, 44 plus 28 is indeed 72. And as t moves on, e to the negative t will approach zero in the limit as t goes to infinity. So the temperature of the object, or the can of Coke in this case, in the refrigerator will approach 44 degrees, which is the surrounding temperature indeed, again, as t goes to infinity. So this model definitely makes sense because e to the negative t again goes to zero in the limit. But now uh, plugging in one, really we just get 44 plus 28 e to the negative one. So I'll approximate this right now. And of course, it's going to be in degrees Fahrenheit. Let's see what we get. All right, so my calculator actually gave me 1.54 hours, so basically an hour and a half. If you want to convert this to minutes, you can actually multiply by 60, and you'll get about 92. Um, you can round up to 93. It's 92.4. I'll round up to 93 because for me, the colder the coat, the better. And this is uh, 93 minutes, which if you subtract 60 from this, you'll get 33. So another way of writing this is one hour and 33 minutes, kind of to be a little more precise. And actually, if you want to take that decimal and multiply what's left over after subtracting 93, or I guess 92, because it was 92.4 in reality, and find out what the decimal part is in seconds, you multiply that by 60, and you'll actually get even more of an accurate answer. But I'm going to stop here and say this is an okay answer for us. And now we're going to move on to one final topic in 3.8, which is a discussion on continuous compound interest, which honestly is a topic from algebra, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, but I am basically going to, um, to note the relationship between what we've been doing here involving exponential models. All right, so this is a result that's usually introduced in algebra. I'm not going to talk about too much as far as why it's true, but it is an example of an exponential function. So usually when exponential functions are introduced in algebra, this is a good application of them. So Recall compound interest, it's A as a function of T, A of T, is A naught, sometimes called P for principle, times the quantity one plus R over N to the N times T, where all of these letters are given by the following. A is the amount after T years, A naught or P is the principal or initial amount that we deposit or borrow, basically the initial amount in an account. R is going to be the APR or annual percent rate, annual percentage rate, and that is normally, well, it's in the percent normally, but obviously in order to use it in an equation, you need it in, in decimal, or else you can't really multiply things together properly. And it's the number of times the percentage rate is compounded per year. So for example, if it's compounded monthly, which is usually the case with banks, that is 12 times per year. And essentially what compounding means is the rate is split up evenly into each compounding period. So if it's monthly, and let's say, just as a simple example, if your rate is 12% per year, instead of applying the 12% at the very end of the year, what, what uh, banks tend to do instead is they split the 12% up into each month, if it's monthly. So since it's 12%, 12 divided by 12 is one, so it's 1% applied for each month. And that actually makes it, um, well, depending on which way, what side you're on, what side of the fence you're on, basically, whether, you, uh, whether you're borrowing money or if you're investing money, 
if you're investing, it's better, but if you're borrowing money, it's kind of worse because the percentage rate is applied more often. Even though it's in smaller doses, it actually ends up being more in the end. So if you were to consider applying 12% to an amount at the very end of the year versus 1% um, every month throughout the year, you'll see that you'll actually have more in the account if you were to compound, no matter how many times you compound. In fact, um, well, we'll see right now that we want to, to strive for continuous compound interest where the rate is compounded every second, basically. So what that means, it doesn't mean that we're, we're increasing our account you know, to infinity or anything like that. It just means that the rate is applied all the time, which as it turns out, isn't super crazy. I mean, it's kind of crazy because the amount just is more than, um, than I guess you can say that's reasonable, kind of, but it's not by an absurd amount. In fact, a result from algebra basically, well, it's kind of a result from calculus and algebra, I guess you could say pre-calculus, is this limit here. So since um, this is the expression for compound interest, that by the way, um, I, again, I didn't say where this comes from, but it, it comes from the just the idea of applying a rate every so often. Notice the R over N, we're dividing the rate into what, however many um, compound periods we have, and then we're taking that to N times T is the amount of compound, the amount of compound periods um, within that given time frame. So if you have three years and there's 12 months in each year and you're compounding monthly, that's 36, which is three times 12 compounding periods. So that's kind of what's going on there. And as N goes to infinity for continuous compound interest, basically what happens with this um, expression, and uh, by the way, I forgot the A naught, but since A naught's a constant, we can pull it outside of the limit in this case. And we'll actually see what happens. It basically turns into an exponential model. Because notice, if you recall this fact here, which we should have seen already, e to the r is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus r over n to the n. And in fact, um, if you replace this r with 1, that's just e, the limit definition of e. And notice here, if you take this as this quantity to the t power, which we can do again because of the uh, exponential uh, property, that when you have a product in the power, it's taking one power before the other. And what you notice here is that this literally is just this definition. So this is really e to the r. So in fact, this model for a continuous compound really just becomes a of t is equal to a naught e to the rt. Now where uh, a naught is, um, where p is used in place of a naught because again, p central principle, which kind of makes more sense in the context of finance, then very often this formula is remembered, mostly by people, as a pert, because a p e r t. Yeah. So <laughs> you get the joke. So now for this uh, for this example here, where it's pretty simple, we're just going to find the amount after investing a thousand dollars for three years, compounding continuously at six percent interest. And notice there is a really really strong relationship between this model and the previous exponential growth models we've seen. Really, it's just exponential growth. That's all it is. So now, R is uh, 0.6, or I guess 0 0.06 really. T is the amount of years, three, and P, or A naught, in this case is 1,000, our initial investment. So now plugging things into our model, we get that A of three, the amount after three years, is A naught, 1,000, times E to the RT, which is 0 0.06 times uh, three, and notice 0 0.06 times 3 is actually 0.18. So we're going to find 1,000 times e to the 0.18. So I'm going to use my calculator here to figure out really quickly what we get. And let's see. So my calculator gave me 11.97 and 22 cents. So that's not too bad. And if you want to compare to what it would be in, let's say, compounding monthly opposed to continuously, it's not too far off. And obviously, this will give you more. So the more often you compound, the more it will be. But even if you compound infinitely many times, it doesn't mean your money goes to infinity or anything like that. So yeah. And in fact, I don't really think any bank really uses comp uh, continuous compound interest. If you know of any, you can comment below maybe. I, um, I've been told that Sears 
uses continuous compound interest, but who knows? Uh, right. So that's all I wanted to say as far as 3.8 is concerned. We saw a lot as far as different applications of the exponential model, but if you think about it, mm, we didn't really do much as far as calculus is concerned. We didn't take any derivatives at all besides checking the differential equation solution, but that was really it. So again, that's all I want to say there, and I'll see you in the next video for chapter 3.9, where we'll be discussing something that does involve calculus a lot, which is known as related rates. And that's going to be pretty fun, I think. In fact, that should remind us more of 3.7, but it's a little more specific. So I'll see you in that video, and um, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you then.